We are interrupting Dr. Phil at this hour because Mayor Latoya Cantrell of New Orleans is holding a news conference about the coronavirus. Right, so let's listen in. Thank you all for being here and thank you for uh, helping us get through this by educating the public and giving them the facts. Um, as uh, this continues to remain a very fluid, fluid operation. Uh, I would like to first begin uh, by uh, having uh, Dr. Jennifer Vegno, the health director for the city of New Orleans, give you an update on where we are in the city with our caseload. You know, we're at 827 with 37 deaths. And uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Vegno to come up at this time and then we'll proceed throughout the press conference. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you, everyone. I am remain, we remain very concerned about the number of known cases of COVID-19 that we have in New Orleans. Um, as the mayor said, today's update uh, from the state brings us to 827 cases in Orleans Parish, 37 of which have resulted in death. Compared with other counties around the country, what we know is that we have one of the highest infection rates um, behind several counties in New York City and a handful of others. To be clear, that's partially because we are doing a great amount of testing, more per person than most other states, and that is, that is a positive development. With our drive-through testing sites that you've all seen and the commercial lab results now really coming online, we will soon have a, a much clearer picture of the true nature of the outbreak in our community. But again, what these numbers continue to tell us is that we have substantial community spread. Each of us needs to act as if we have been exposed to this virus. That's why it is so incredibly important to continue to stay home right now. The best way to slow the spread is to limit interpersonal contact between individuals to the greatest extent possible. I am really, really happy to say that our community members, all of us, all of you have been listening. Um, we have been on the streets. We have seen how little traffic there is. We have data from an external source that indicates that over the last week, there's been a huge decrease in the average distance traveled in Orleans Parish, more than almost anywhere else in the country. That tells me that everybody is doing their part and, and we are so appreciative that will save lives, but we have to keep it up. This is a marathon not a sprint. We won't even be able to see or know the effects of our stay-at-home mandate for another week or more. We should expect that. That's due to the incubation period of this virus, and we expect to have a long road ahead to continue to slow the spread of the disease. So I want to prepare you now, as the governor said yesterday, that in the coming weeks, we, or even less than weeks, we will be facing a serious capacity problem in our hospitals. As as more people get sick and as more people need to be admitted to our hospitals, we may run out of hospital beds. We have been preparing for this for weeks. Our hospitals have been preparing for this for weeks. We have been working with the state on hospital surge plans, which you'll hear about more in the coming days and the governor alluded to today. Just like other major cities all over the world, we continue to face shortages of medical equipment, personal protective equipment. The major disaster declaration that the president issued last night, we hope, will help to unlock the federal resources that we need to assist in this. Please remember that through all of us, our healthcare workers and our first responders continue to provide care at great sacrifice to themselves and the people they love. Many of them have, be, have been exposed to COVID-19 and are continuing to work safely with protective equipment as long as they can. There are many things you can do to support them, and really they and our vulnerable population are who we should be focusing on now. Don't become one of their patients. Stay home, avoid close contact with others. If you're a medical professional and you're not already volunteering or working, please do so. Sign up at ready.nola.gov to volunteer. If you're not a healthcare worker, there are many ways that you can help. 
reach out to friends and family who are and see what they need, whether that's to drop a homemade meal off on their porch, to have some groceries delivered, whatever you can do for them. You can donate to groups like the Crew of Red Beans and other organizations that are employing some of our hospitality workers and feeding healthcare professionals every day. That's a win-win. Remember, they came to work for you, so please stay home for them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Avegno. We cannot overstate um, just the thank yous uh, that we go out or we put out, but also encourage you to do the same as it relates to our first responders who have been on the front lines from day one. This also includes, of course, our health care professionals. Uh, as Dr. Avegno alluded to, they are working tirelessly on behalf of all of us in our city and uh, they just just deserve uh, for us to follow the rules and that means stay home and um, the public you know the public is responding and we want to say thank you as well again to our residents who are staying at home and being very creative uh, while they're at home and that's a good thing um, as it relates to uh, our continued advocacy I will say uh, at uh, the federal level is where we will continue to focus. Uh, we are very grateful uh, for uh, the movement on last night as it relates uh, to uh, the uh, governor's mayor, um, major disaster declaration also being uh, approved at the federal level. That will unlock uh, the resources that we need on the ground here in the city of New Orleans. However, we are pushing, we're pushing for more. On the front end of that is the 75-25 split uh, that is required as relates to uh, federal assistance, meaning that the city of New Orleans will be responsible for putting up 25 percent uh, of the dollars. And so we're already uh, cash strapped, as you know, and this will uh, prove to be very difficult uh, for the city of New Orleans to continue operations but at the end of the day to stand up government once we get through uh, this pandemic. Also, we're pushing for individual assistance program at the federal level. Uh, we're asking that they really circle back on this to include uh, the individual assistance program as part of the uh, major disaster declaration. Uh, this will thoroughly assist uh, our residents, but also as it relates to the uh, feeding of our residents through the USDA food uh, program. Uh, we're asking for the USDA to grant us a waiver. We have made multiple requests. Our federal delegation has been at the table, literally relentlessly, even on calls this, this afternoon, uh, and asking again for this flexibility, for this waiver. Our food banks are in desperate need of additional food supply as we expect to run out as we move towards the end of this week and approaching uh, next week. We're also asking that the uh, local threshold in terms of the population threshold for state stabilization fund, uh, and we're asking that that's a $150 billion program that we're talking about. Uh, what we want is for uh, this program to be uh, more mirrored along the uh, CDBG dollars uh, instead of one with the requirements as they stand right now is for populations that are 500,000 people or above. And so we're not at the 500,000 uh, population mark, as you already know, which is why we're pushing for that census, for everyone to complete the census. But at the CDBG level, that applies uh, to municipalities 50,000 people or more or greater. So we're right, you know, in that in that uh, in that sweet spot. Uh, we're less than 500,000, of course, over 50,000. But the CDBG program works very much more efficiently, and this is what we are wanting uh, for the city of New Orleans, for the state of Louisiana. Uh, make no mistake about that. 
Um, we are also uh, wanting to ensure that uh, DSNAP, that program, gets off the ground. We know that these dollars and all these resources will be in partnership with the state of Louisiana, going uh, through the state, coming uh, to the city of New Orleans. And so we are staying uh, focused, keeping our eye on the ball, and that is uh, where the rubber meets the road in terms of our ability to meet our people where they are. Dr. Vegno talked about surge. You know, we've been talking about surge capacity for weeks now. Uh, but as we look at the upcoming, at the end of this week, looking at next week, uh, that uh, April 7th mark is a benchmark for us. We believe at that point in time, we will have uh, saturated our hospitals. And so we're working uh, very aggressively at this time to stand up uh, a uh, medical uh, station uh, that will accommodate up to 3,000 uh, patients. And so we're working on this now. I have our Director of Homeland Security, Colin Arnold, uh, who has been on the ground uh, with the state partners, with uh, General Parker, uh, with the uh, National Guard. And um, I'll ask Colin to come up and just give a little bit more detail. Colin? Afternoon. As you know, President Trump approved Governor Edward Bell Edwards' request for a major statewide disaster declaration last night. Locally, that declaration allows us to be eligible for federal reimbursement for the emergency protective measures that we've taken and will take to respond to this continuing disaster. We're in constant communication with our partners at the state and federal government about ongoing needs, as you've heard, of which we have many. We're so grateful for the hard work being done by the nonprofit community and organizations and volunteers to support the needs of our most vulnerable community members during this time. Out on the front line caring for our people is you. If you run a grocery, if you can do a grocery run or order a, neighbor, uh, a meal for a neighbor in need, please lend a hand. Houses of worship and neighborhood organizations are also doing their part. Today we announced a new partnership with World Central Kitchen and Hands On New Orleans, which will deliver meals to homebound, low-income seniors or chronically ill residents who are sheltering in place. We know these folks face a greater risk of severe illness ex if exposed to COVID-19, and so many are staying indoors, and we encourage that. This program is for people who really have no other option. If you can afford to get groceries or a meal, this isn't for you. Folks in need of a meal delivery should call 311 to register. Meals will begin on Monday. We're also looking for volunteers to deliver meals. If you'd like to volunteer for that or any other means, please go to ready.nola.gov. These volunteer hours and donations are important because we can track them, we are tracking them, and they can contribute to whatever our federal cost share ends up being. And we are grateful for this. The drive-through testing program continues and is running smoothly. To date, we've tested 2,400 people at two sites in Jefferson Parish, and uh, two sites in Orleans Parish, excuse me, and another 1,250 people at the Jefferson Parish site at the Alario Center. FEMA informed me today that we have become the standard for this program, and they are starting a resupply tomorrow. So we will continue this testing as long as we are able to with the supplies and inventory that we are given by the federal government. I'd like to thank the Louisiana National Guard. I, I, I can't say enough about the program that they've helped us with, the New Orleans Health Department, Dr. Jen, the Medical Reserve Corps, and also the U.S. Public Health Service, which has been on the ground with us uh, throughout uh, since Saturday with the testing sites. As Dr. Avegno said, our hospital capacity in this region is dwindling and will soon be overwhelmed. Our partners at the state and federal government have been tire tirelessly developing plans for a hospital surge and an isolation surge. Um, we've already set up an isolation surge in the area, as you all know. With, the, with current projections, we expect to meet, need additional hospital beds within weeks. As you're seeing around the country, Louisiana and New Orleans are preparing to mobilize in a way that many of us have never seen and hopefully we will not have to see again in our lifetimes, but it is happening. This disaster will define us for generations. Thank you.
You know, you are only as effective as the people you surround yourself with. And it's just an honor and a privilege to have hardworking men and women continuing to keep government functioning and operating at our highest level and of quality. So I appreciate you, Colin. I appreciate you, Doc Dr. Jen. You know, and we're in this together. We understand that. And um, we'll continue to not only uplift one another, but uh, understanding that that only translates and transfers to the people that we serve, and that is the citizens of the city of New Orleans, all of our residents who matter. And uh, all of our folks who are on the front lines, I tell you, um, we can't do it without you. And we really do appreciate you. On that uh, note, I just want to go, uh, LaTanya, to questions and answers. I think that's always a good way to field, you know, some of the questions that our reporters may have. Uh, this is from Paul Dudley. Uh, today the governor said he's considering the Morial Convention Center to house non-critical patients as hospital surge. Uh, how will it be staffed and do we have enough medical personnel to care for those patients? Sure, so we are standing up uh, what we're calling uh, our medical um, station. It will be able to provide uh, service to up to 3,000 patients. These are patients that are positive patients that have been uh, getting treatment and service at our hospitals throughout the city, uh, patients that will be moved towards or really going towards recovery, uh, that will be moved out of our hospitals into surge capacity where they can continue to get the service, continue to get better and the resources that they need, but also free up space at our hospitals for those who are suffering at a higher and greater level uh, and who are even more vulnerable. This also speaks to the issues of ventilators. So um, we don't anticipate the use of ventilators at this particular surge uh, station. Uh, what we do want to do is continue to free up those beds for our patients who will need to be on ventilators or who currently are. But as people uh, move through recovery or move towards recovery, they will then be transitioned and relocated uh, to the Mor Morial Convention Center. Uh, follow up. Uh, are there enough medical personnel in the greater New Orleans area to take care of this? Well, one thing about it, and, and I'll bring Colin up as well, one of the things that is unique about uh, not only the city of New Orleans, but the state of Louisiana in this pandemic situation is that we prepare for uh, hurricane season every year. And so there are multiple contracts that we have at the state level, for example, in the need uh, of a hurricane or a disaster. And so uh, one of these contracts, and uh, Colin can speak a little bit more in detail, uh, but it was previously secured to stand up uh, in the need of an emergency uh, for additional medical professionals to provide those services to the state of Louisiana. And so we are ahead of the curve on that, and we will be able to have uh, staffing uh, to meet the needs uh, of the 3,000 patients that will uh, receive support and services at uh, the convention center. We're also working with our higher ed community, uh, LSU, as well as Tulane, and urging uh, them to allow for uh, their students to get the best training that they can receive on the ground and I'm telling you uh, we had conversations with them today and uh, to uh, think about uh, getting again our students out of that classroom setting academically and really boots on the ground rendering uh, not only the best service but also in a, uh, a way that they can get the best experience so with that I'll ask Colin to give you a little bit more mayor pretty much covered it but it is a state contract that's been activated they have minimums of amount of personnel in the thousands that can be here and they have access up to 35,000 healthcare professionals across the country that will come here this will not be necessarily our local health care providing this because uh, you know the training obviously will be invaluable for students but we know that our frontline health care workers in this community right now are fully engaged in this and they're not going anywhere as far as from their facilities that they work at so this is this is additional people coming here to do this uh, have you all begun to see any supply of the much needed medical supplies 
that are coming from the federal government, like uh, all the PPE gear, uh, medical, uh, uh, you know, the face masks and stuff. And then as a second question, um, what city services will be diminished in trying to meet the 75-25 split for the federal assistant? Well, in terms of diminished uh, in regards to that, I, I, I will not speak to that. The bottom line is that the city of New Orleans has been at limited, you know, working at limited capacity, meaning standing up uh, those departments that are deemed critical uh, to operating uh, city government because we're still open and we're still doing business and we have created systems and processes to where the public can still uh, get uh, the resources that they need as well as uh, get the services that they need from the city but able to access them remotely and so this was a, a, a game changer for us and very excited about it because I'm telling you we've been able to stand up uh, our assets um, that we were working to stand up uh, in the post cyber attack um, environment. So this speaks uh, to like, for example, uh, code enforcement and safety and permits. Uh, we were waiting for our llama systems, different systems to come back online and we're, they're online. So they're at a, we're at a better place than we were uh, really since the uh, cyber attack. So that's good news uh, for the city of New Orleans and the services that we're able to provide uh, the residents with. But as it relates to that 75, 25, I think that's, that's too early for me to answer that. Uh, in regards to equipment and people PPE and, and what we're seeing on the ground, I, I'll have Dr. Vegno kind of speak to that, but we're seeing some things happen. All right, you are continuing to watch a press conference by the city of New Orleans. President Donald Trump and the Coronavirus National Task Force is also holding a news conference at the same time. If you'd like to hear what the president, Dr. Fauci, and others have to say about the current national situation, switch over to WUPL, that's Cox Channel 2, Charter, Charter Channel 16, and you can listen to the president's comments there. Until then, let's finish listening to the city's press conference, and of course, we'll join you for Eyewitness News starting at 5. We would like. To be able to get tested, um, do they need any state ID? No, we can answer that. You just go on up and get. Yes, ma'am. So, as a requirement of the federal program, they do need to be a Louisiana res resident for the drive-through testing. Uh, but other than that, there. Uh, other than that, the only other requirement is that they are symptomatic. They have fever, or cough, shortness of breath. And that's what the pilot program, which is a, a very different uh, setup. So with the two drive-up testing sites that are affiliated with the federal program, a Louisiana state ID is required. And all of our other testing sites throughout the city, whether that is our FQHC, you know, our clinics, our hospitals and the like, no ma'am. Uh, this is from Sherman DeSalle. With the stay-at-home mandates by the governor and the pilot drive-through testing, do you feel optimistic at all about us seeing a change in the trajectory anytime soon? Well, with the increase in testing, uh, as well as the flexibility granted by the federal government for uh, lab testing, meaning locally, like with Ashna, for example, um, I'm, it's... I'm feeling confident that we, with the data collection methods, that we will be able to see where our curve is. Dr. Vegno has been charting this data every single day uh, with charts and, and all of uh, the data analytics that are needed. Um, and it's making us, um, you know, we're not out of the woods at all by any means. But as we get the data and learn the data and see trends, it helps us have a better understanding in terms of how we're impacted and how long we should be in this. But I'll let Dr. Vegno give you a little bit more detail. Yes, you know, as with anything in science, the more data you have, the better your decisions can be. And so that's very helpful. But that does not mean that we are looking anytime soon to expect, you know, one number is not a trend. Um, we know that this is a long tunnel. We're at the beginning of the tunnel. There will be a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but we're taking everything um, as it comes and, and just really hoping that our, we can curve 
sooner than we think, but we're in this for the long haul. Um, and the second question is, a couple of weeks ago, you talked about the conference calls with community groups. Has that continued? And if so, what's been discussed? And what are some of the group's concerns? Well, I think we've covered um, a majority of the concerns, um, really all of the concerns, and not so much with this press conference, but as we have been communicating uh, and pushing out information and data to the public on all levels. Um, the public, of course, is concerned about testing, as they should, you know. They've been concerned about um, access uh, to unemployment insurance. They've been concerned about, you know, layoffs. Uh, they've been concerned about first responders. Um, they've been concerned about making sure that they have adequate food supply and nutrition. They've been concerned about our seniors, of uh, those that are sick and shut in. Um, they've been concerned about our homeless population. I think they've been concerned about everything that we're concerned about. And, um, and I think that's how I know I gauge uh, my focus and my priority is from that bottom up. And so, yes, we will continue to have outreach, absolutely. Um, we cannot get through this without community, uh, and, um, and we just can't. So having the uh, lines of communication open and always being accessible to listen is a priority for my administration, but it's going to be the only way that we can really respond to the needs of the public. And so, yes, we'll continue to do that on, every, on all fronts with the general public, uh, with our hospitality and, and um, uh, tourism industry. I have calls every day with the business community, with our faith leaders, um, even uh, started uh, a committee uh, focusing on um, deaths and burials, you know, meaning from the funeral uh, community, um, meaning the mortuary community, um, and looking at policies associated with that. So we're focused, and I'm telling you, it's what we get from that ground that keeps us uh, not only focused, but on what's priority.